Hi, my name is April Spears. I am the Exhibition and Gallery Coordinator here at Gallery 76, run by the Embroiderers Guild NSW. Uh, and this is our Festival of Lace, happening in 2021. So the festival uh, is a five-week festival that covers all types of lace, from historic lace to contemporary lace, and we've really done our best to bring together as wide a range of lace styles and techniques as possible. So lace is mostly broken down into categories by technique. Um, sort of the two main camps would be bobbin lace, which is the most traditional form of lace making, and needle lace. Um, but there's other sort of subcategories as well. You've also got knotted lace, um, machine made lace, obviously more contemporary, tatted, crocheted, uh, knitted, the whole different um, variety of ways you can make lace and all of them represented here in this exhibition. Um, behind me this is a board of needle lace, needle made lace and again of course there's varieties within that. This is all buttonhole needle lace using a basic buttonhole stitch and uh, this technique has spanned centuries. So for instance here we've got a beautiful piece of Venetian rose point lace um, which is from the um, probably early to mid 1600s. This is a buttonhole lace and there's these gorgeous little raised sections made by using bundles of thread or horsehair which they would then do the buttonhole stitch over to sort of work over and give it that raised look. Uh, and that evolved out of a much earlier um, style of lace from the 1500s um, called plat point or Venetian flat point lace, uh, which we have a very small example of over here. And we've got this gorgeous piece of a Point de Gars um, bertha, which was a beautiful Victorian collar that they wore uh, on their dresses, probably just off the shoulders. Uh, and it's a really beautiful, very fine um, version of buttonhole needle lace. And so then, nearly 400 years later, we have more um, buttonhole needle lace, and this is by uh, a local Sydney artist, Maggie Hetzel Brown, who's done uh, these pieces of 2020 uh, pandemic lace, doing scenes from all of our lives during the lockdown and COVID. So she's got these, you know, again using a very historic, traditional technique, these gorgeous scenes of, you know, women lying on the couch with laptops, drinking a, you know, cup of tea, spilled coffee, uh, dreaming of the pub, lying on the bed, bra off, scrolling through your phone, making sure your bank account's okay when you've lost your job. So they're these fantastic, you know, they've got almost, um, 16th century look to them in an aesthetic, but the scenes could not be more contemporary. Uh, and I love that she's drawn on this historical uh, style and technique uh, to create these stunning uh, contemporary pieces. So like Maggie Hensel Brown's work, these are pieces are by a local artist working in needle lace as her medium, uh, Nell Bryn, uh, and she's exploring sort of contemporary women's uh, issues, which again is quite an appropriate theme to explore using lace uh, as a technique. We've got Virginia Woolf here with a lovely quote by her, and then other pieces exploring uh, issues about women's domestic violence. Buttonhole needle lace is probably one of the primary forms of, of needle made laces, but you also have embroidered nets. Carrot and Cross uh, is a traditional Irish style of embroidered net where you sandwich, tool, uh, and embroider it. Um, although it was originally from France, but the style evolved and is now named after an Irish town. So that's another very famous style of needle made lace. Um, another famous um, sort of subcategory needle lace would be uh, tape laces, needle made tape laces, where you take a piece of machine braid and you um, manipulate it into shape, much like you would with a bobbin tape lace, but in this case we're using a braid and manipulate it into place to sort of mimic that look, but using needles and embroidery. So in embroidered tape laces, um, the way you can tell them apart from a bobbin tape lace is that in a bobbin tape lace, um, the tape, the braid, is worked continually with the bobbins. In a needle tape lace, you're using a machine-made braid, and that is then manipulated into position and stitched down, which makes it an embroidered lace. So in an embroidered tape lace, you'll see those folds of the tape, which you wouldn't see in a bobbin tape lace. Um, we've got a whole variety of board examples here. Some of the most well-known uh, styles of embroidered tape lace would be um, Boris lace uh, and Princess lace, which is very popular on wedding veils uh, for quite some time. Unlike an embroidered lace, bobbin lace is worked using bobbins rather than an embroidering needle. Uh, and bobbins are attached via a pin to the pattern called a pricking and then worked in pairs from there. Bobbin lace can roughly be split into two subcategories. 
We've got continuous bobbin lace where the entire pattern is worked by bobbins continually. And then you have sectional or part bobbin lace where the motifs are worked separately and then stitched together. So this is a particularly gorgeous example of um, sectional bobbin lace. It's called Jessarum lace. Uh, it's from the 1800s. Uh, it was originally um, from a school in Venice, uh, but again spread around, uh, around Europe after it gained immense popularity at the Paris Exhibition in the 1850s. Uh, so this is a bobbin lace, but rather than being one monochrome colour, uh, the Jessarum school uses um, varied um, multicolored threads, which means as well as keeping the pattern in mind, you have to have different colored threads in your bobbins, uh, keeping those in mind as you go. Uh, and it was immensely popular because of this delicacy of color uh, and this immaculate blending that they achieved uh, in the bobbin lace pieces. So this would be a dress front uh, and two cuffs. These are both bobbin lace pieces, they're nearly 100 years apart. This is a small uh, gold lace sample made of uh, metal thread from, the, uh, from around 1818. This one is one of my favourite pieces, it's a piece of Belgian war lace. Um, so during World War I, after the Germans uh, invaded, uh, the country was block blocked off, blockaded, uh, and there was no ability for supplies to get in. Several million Belgian people were uh, on the verge of starvation, uh, and so there was a um, uh, an attempt by the Allies to try and support the Belgian economy by shipping in lace and buying it back to help support these families during this time. There are roughly 50,000 women around the country uh, making hundreds of thousands of pieces of bobbin, laces, uh, bobbin lace, which were then exported to Allied countries uh, and bought enthusiastically. So it's a lace you'll find um, worldwide now because of this um, enthusiastic support from the Allies during World War One, uh, and they would often feature uh, motifs that would uh, appeal to the allied nations. So you've got uh, in this piece you've got the bear representing Russia, you've got the lion for Belgium, uh, the rooster for France and the unicorn for the United Kingdom. This is a whole board of continuous bobbin lace so where that pattern is worked continually. Um, lots of gorgeous pieces here from all around uh, Europe. Um, so my favourite ones is this beautiful little uh, example of Bedfordshire lace which is a very well known style of bobbin lace. Um, we've also got Buckinghamshire lace, which is or Bucks Point as it's more commonly known. We've got a beautiful example here of Clooney, uh, which is technically a Bedfordshire lace, but it um, has a sort of gorgeous medieval aesthetic to it after the Musée de Clooney in Paris. Um, there's also a lovely border here of Maltese lace. Um, Maltese lace um, is traditionally worked in silk uh, and it always of course features the traditional Maltese cross, which is how uh, you can spot a Maltese lace. Um, so behind we have some examples of chemical and machine made lace, which is what most lace would be today. Um, the history of the introduction of mechanical or chemical lace sort of spans the 19th century. At the start of it we have the invention of the lace net making machine um, by John Heathcote in 1808. And at the end of it we have the invention of Schifferle or chemical lace uh, in Switzerland. Um, so in chemical lace um, they use a, a machine to embroider the pattern over the fabric that is uh, being treated to dissolve in a chemical bath uh, and then the base fabric falls away leaving just the lace um, pattern on top. You can spot these chemical laces by a sort of fuzzy quality to them even though they're often uh, designed to mimic a traditional embroidered or bobbin lace. So this huge um, portrait is a piece by uh, local city artist Jane Teo, uh, it's of her friend Kathy, and this is also uh, a mechanical or you know, machine made lace. Uh, interestingly the technique is very very similar to the Shipley lace uh, of the 19th century. So Jane will embroider, machine embroidery, uh, over dissolvable fabric. Um, today we have fabric that's uh, designed to dissolve in water rather than a chemical bath so it's much safer to use uh, and that's how Jane will work her pieces, dissolve the base fabric and again be left with this beautiful lace portrait um, when the base fabric is dissolved. I absolutely love this piece by um, artist Lin Yu Duen who also coordinated the lace panels down the front of our building. Um, so this is an example of bobbin lace but rather than using cotton or silk as would be traditional, uh, Lindy has used old telephone copper wires to work that bobbin lace and she's connected them to two old headsets and uh, the piece is called Conversations from the Past which I think is fantastic especially in an exhibition looking at the history and future of lace because lace is always going to be in conversation uh, with the past. 
So these are all examples of knotted and woven lace, um, which is a difficult subcategory because of course all lace is technically knotted lace, uh, but this is its sort of primary technique, I suppose. Uh, and it is a style that spans the world. We've got a whole bunch of examples here from colonial Australia. It was a very uh, popular style in colonial Australia. Um, so as well as colonial Australian examples, you know, we have examples from Paraguay, and Andruti lace is very popular there. You've got Turkish lace, Armenian lace, um, Palestinian lace and Hungarian lace. So this is a style or technique that really travels uh, across the world. We have uh, a selection of cut, pulled and drawn threadwork lace pieces, which is arguably an earlier form of lace. So in all of these styles, you're working from base fabric and then pulling, uh, drawing out, cutting, removing threads to be left with a lace aesthetic. Um, this is um, Richelieu lace or um, Grosso Tagliato in Italian uh, and that's quite a heavy looking lace uh, and again buttonholed um, to um, uh, accentuate the pattern. This is a style that um, is found all over the world so as well as the uh, French Italian uh, Richelieu work. Um, we've got beautiful examples here from uh, the Philippines which is using a, a grass linen uh, to work pattern with. We've got Hedebo which is from Denmark, Mexican drawn threadwork, a very well known style uh, of drawn threadwork lace, Punto Terrato again Italian uh, and a whole bunch of others. Um, so behind me we have some gorgeous lace garments um, learned from the National Trust, um, which give a, give a good overview of um, lace in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, and how it was worn. Um, so this is a lovely Edwardian nightgown. Um, this lace and a lot of the other lace is machine made lace. Um, uh, it's right after mechanized lace became possible and the crazed lace on anything you could put it on, nightgowns, nightcaps, dresses, just took off absolutely. It's a gorgeous uh, Edwardian gown in a, a lovely apricot coloured silk uh, and it's got lace here against all machine made lace but it's imitating traditional handmade styles of lace and it's doing a very good job actually. So you've got this lace which is sort of mimicking a reticella or Emilia Dellars sort of style and the borders here would be what would be called carrot cross was it worked by hand uh, but again it's all machine lace mimicking those handmade styles. This absolutely stunning piece is a gentleman's uh, ensemble from the 18th century. Now the suit is original to the 18th century we believe um, but it's been adapted to fancy dress in the 19th century. We know this because uh, of the alterations made. The buttons are from a shop uh, in Sydney in the 1800s. And finally, the lace is also from the 19th century. It's not original. The cuffs and the jabot have been stitched on, which would never have been the case historically. Honestine is also um, a very traditional 19th century lace. So this is an 18th century suit that's been adapted for fancy dress or theatre in the 19th century uh, but it gives a fantastic uh, impression of how lace was for many centuries um, substantially or perhaps even primarily worn by men. It was not a feminine uh, accessory as we think of it today. Uh, it was very much gender neutral, uh, open to everyone. Um, so this floor holds all the knitted, tatted and crocheted laces. Uh, and again, uh, traditional lace makers, lace purists, uh, would, would not categorise knitted lace as, as lace. Um, but if you look at some of these examples, you'll see why we've included them. It's definitely um, as fine as many of the more traditional lace types. So this board is primarily Irish crochet. Um, Irish crochet was introduced into Ireland in the 1820s, but took off in a big way uh, in the 1840s and 50s uh, after the Irish famine. There was literally whole schools, convent schools uh, created to teach this craft to women so they could support their households during this time of famine. Uh, Queen Victoria again very deliberately um, purchased uh, Irish crochet lace and popularized it, um, popularized it uh, in fashion uh, which made it incredibly popular throughout uh, the 19th century. Um, these are some stunning Irish lace net sleeves um, from around the middle of the 1800s. These are a little bit later, around 1890, but incredibly fine Irish lace leg and button sleeves. The kind of sleeves that are tight on the forearm and then a sort of balloon sleeve above that. So these are all uh, knitted and tattered laces. Uh, my favourite piece here is this stunning little um, mat worked by one of our uh, members, um, <laughs> worked by one of our members, Margaret Wilkins, who's a member of the Embroiderers Guild and of the Australian Lace Guild. 
pattern for this piece and for many others uh, is by a very famous pattern designer called Herbert Niebling, uh, who was born turn of the century in Austria. And he's really the, um, the grandmaster of uh, lace knitting. Uh, as of, at age six, as a child, he was knitting his own stockings. Age, um, age eight, he's teaching the girls in his class to knit. And at age nine, he copied a grandmaster um, portrait from a postcard um, without the use of a pattern. Um, as an adult, he started his own um, business, um, creating uh, these very, very intricate lace knitted designs that would be sold to magazines for, for women to work at home. He was then conscripted into the German army during World War I and ended up as a POW. Uh, he remembers in his time in a POW camp uh, knitting these fine lace tablecloths for his commanding officers, which were widely appreciated in the camp, as you might imagine, uh, but also widely appreciated here. This little piece was, uh, was knitted using 0.8 millimeter needles. Incredibly, incredibly fine knitting. Uh, and some of his large designs for tablecloths can have up to 300 lines of knitting instructions. So this incredible lace installation down the front of our building uh, was the uh, brainchild of the amazing Melbourne artist Lindy Dijuen, uh, who is a public lace artist uh, alongside Vicky Taylor, uh, and the two of them coordinated this massive project. It's all handmade bobbin lace. They had 15 um, hand bobbin lace makers working with them to complete the project, uh, and their um, panels are installed down the front of our three-storey building. Thanks for watching this short video uh, taking you through the exhibition of the Festival of Lace at Gallery 76, the Embroiderers Guild, New South Wales. I uh, would like to thank the City of Canada Bay for the generous sponsorship of the event. Uh, I would love to invite you all here to visit at Gallery 76 in the future.